So what we're looking at here is the Pressbooks dashboard once a user has logged in. So if you have a Pressbooks account, whether it's through your university or whether it's an open source hosted network or whether you've gone to pressbooks.com and just created your own book, what you'll generally see when you log in is a dashboard that looks something like this. And the first thing that a user could do if you just want to get started and have never done anything in Pressbooks before would be to create a new book. So from this menu, there's an option that says create a new book. And you'll be brought to a screen like this. You won't see a big list like this because you probably will be doing it for the first time but it will give you a bit of instructions and it will say, you're gonna choose a web address for your book to live. This is where people will be able to find your book once it's published to the web um, and it will be a more or less permanent address for your book, so choose it carefully. It needs to be at least four characters and it can only contain numbers and letters. So in this particular case, I'm gonna call this a webinar demo book. And the initial part will be the name of your network. So whatever your, your Pressbooks network root is, you can't change that. You're just adding the last bit of the URL. And we'll give this book a title. It's gonna be called Webinar Demo Book. You can specify a language. If your Pressbooks uh, installation has multiple languages installed, you may be working in a target language that's not English or Spanish, or maybe French, maybe any of the languages that we support. So in this case, I'll say my book's in English. And I'm gonna start by choosing not to make my book public yet but later I'll show you how to make it public. So the first step is creating a book. Um, and once you've created a book, you'll see it takes a couple of seconds here because I'm screen sharing recording, but I will have now have an empty book shell that I can start to work in. So here I've got started in my book and I have an empty shell. And you're gonna see in my dashboard here, now I have my books and I can see all the books that I belong to. And I will also see, this is the dashboard for the book that I'm working in right now, the webinar demo book. And along the left-hand side of the, me the menu is a big, inside of the book dashboard. And this is where all the magic happens for my book. The first thing I'm gonna do though is visit my book's homepage. So I will now know that at integrations.pressbooks.network webinar demo, this is the homepage, the landing page for my book. And this book is kind of boring looking because it's just vanilla, right? There's like a placeholder cover, there's almost no information, there's a tiny table of contents, almost no book information, and no metadata. If I were to go to a uh, a better, uh, not a better, but a more fleshed out book, like let's say I would go to Guide to Publishing, or Guide to Making Open Textbooks with Students. Or Guide to Making Open Textbooks so far. This is a really nice book. So here's an example of what a homepage might look like if I've done a bit more work. You'll see a, a title, some authors or editors, a cover, the books available for download in all these different formats, a description, the, the, the license that the book was published under, in this case, a Creative Commons license. I can jump right into the book and read, or I can view the table of contents, collapse the sections, and jump into whatever I want to read. I can see even more book information, including subject. And then at the bottom, there'll be a bunch of metadata or information about this book, a publisher, publication date, ISBNs, subjects, contributor, editor, authors, and so forth. So the thing I want to show you next is, well, how do we get from sad, empty book to good, finished, published book? The way that we would do that is from our dashboard, we're going to start by clicking on the book info information. And book info will be anything that we want to appear on the book homepage or be associated with the book as metadata, we just start entering in this form. So I might say, I want to list a new contributor so this would be someone who's made a contribution to this book. Since Joel was the first person to talk in this webinar, I'm gonna pick on Joel and I'm gonna add Joel as an author of this book. I know Joel from graduate school, so I think it's probably fair. So I've added Joel Glad. And I'll come back to book info now, and I'll say the author of this book is actually Joel Glad, and I'm the editor. And then I'll scroll down and I'll say the publisher of this book, it's uh, Steel Press. Publisher City, I'm in Madison. Publication date, let's say this is gonna be published on April Fool's Day, perfect. <laughs> and if I have an ISBN or a DOI, I can enter it. I don't have one for this book right, right now. I can set a language. I could upload an image, a cover image. It gives me a little bit of instructions for what to do there. I can choose a subject for this book. This book is gonna be about software. Uh, it's about word processing software, sure. And then I could pick other subjects. 
I could say the copyright holder here. I'll say it's Joel. And Joel, uh, what copyright license would you like to license this book under? Uh, let's do, <clears throat> what is the Creative Commons 4.0? What would that be similar to? That yeah, probably CC, the most common would probably be CCBY, yeah. the Creative CCBY. Commons Attribution. Okay, so Joel's choosing a very permissive copyright license. Your mm, great yeah. choice, Joel, I appreciate it. So we've just chosen CCBY. And if we wanted to, you could list another copyright notice that lets people know how you want the book to be cited or anything else about copyright or permissions you want it to list. You could add a short description. This is going to be a fun book and a long description here. And I'm going to save all this information. So I just wrote a bunch of stuff about my book. And now you'll look, if we visit the book's homepage, you'll see, oh, okay, here's the title. Here's the author. Here's that short description I wrote. It's now saying that it's listed under a Creative Commons CCBY license. And down below, we have a bit more metadata that we've entered, publisher, publication date, subject, author, editor. And that's basically how you enter information. That can be done at any time for your book. And that's where you get started adding metadata or other information. I'm gonna pause and say I got a couple of messages. Okay, so, so Val says, what's the status with private versus public access to a book that we create? Great question, Val. So if this, this book right now is private, which means that if you were to visit this URL and you were not logged in, so for example, let me log out, what you would see is, I'm sorry, this book is private and accessible only to registered users. All right, so then I'd have to log in. And if I had the right permissions, I'd be able to see the book. So that's the major difference between public and private for a book itself. You can also, let me show you in just a second. So now I'm logged back in. If I want to, the next big menu where everything happens is the organize menu. So I come to the organize menu and I can see at the top, I have a global privacy status. Let me toggle that to public. Now, if you were to visit this website and not and be not logged in, you would see, oh, there's a book here. And here's the content in that book. I've just made the book globally public. I can also go in and make any one of these chapters private so that a part of the book was public and a part was private. So hopefully that answers the question that you had there, Val. Any other questions so far about metadata or public versus private? All right, terrific. So I'm going to jump back I, into the- Actually, but still I had one quick question about that. Is there a semi-private option where you can release it to a select group of unregistered users? Yes, there is. I'm glad that you asked. So, okay, let me show you. So there's a couple of different things that you can do. When we're looking at this menu right here, you're gonna see there's a bunch of content. This is the table of contents for my book. So right now, there's, it's very bare bones. I just made an empty book. So I have an introduction, which is a couple words, a chapter, a section here, or a part we would call it, and then a piece of back matter. I can see right here by clicking this, this is gonna make, decide whether that piece of content is visible or invisible to the web to logged out users. So this is the private public toggle for an individual chapter. If I had multiple chapters, I could select them all and unselect them all by clicking on the heading as well. But if I go inside the chapter, you're going to see there's a couple of different status and visibility options. There's the same choice about whether it's shown in the web or shown in exports. And there's also a require a password setting. So if you wanted to make this visible to people that didn't have accounts, uh, but had some other protection, you could just put a password on it and the password might be demo and I'll save that so that what will happen now is I'll show you, I'll open this chapter. This content is password protected. So if someone visits this on the open web, they have to type demo here and now, okay, we know who they are. They can read the content. That would be the way that you'd make content semi public if that's what you wanted to do. Okay. I'm going to take you back to the organized page and I'm going to say, all right, so now I have a shell of a book. How do I get content into my book? Well, the first and most common way would be, well, maybe I have something already written elsewhere. Many of us will work in word processor documents or work in Google Docs or work in some other creative or some other word processing thing where we have a document already written. So I'm going to say, let's say I have a word document. That's a common way that people work. We're going to come in this book down to tools and we'll click import. And you'll see a bunch of different kinds of documents can be imported. I'm going to pick Word document or OpenOffice. Let's pick Word document first. 
And then I'm going to pick the file I want to upload. So on my computer, I think I have one called demo files and I have a, a chapter that's ready to import. So I'm going to pick this word document and I'm going to say begin import. This document Pressbooks parsed it and it says, oh, we think this is broken into six different sections. Do you want, which of these do you want us to bring in as chapters? And I'll say, yeah, let's get all of them and let's show these pieces in the web. So I'm going to import this. So what Pressbooks is doing is importing that Word document and now all that content, I'll erase the old ch chapter one so it's not confusing, but here's the content I just imported and brought in. So for example, if you were to view this, you'd be like, oh, this used to be in a Word document, now it's in Pressbooks. This is a heading, here's a footnote even that came in, a block quote, I go to the next chapter, I could even bring in text in columns, there's a link in there. If I go to the next chapter, this is bulleted lists, we start to get into chapter headings. This is from Kafka's The Metamorphosis. So if you see Gregor, that's what we were reading about. And you can see, oh, we brought in a bunch of content here just through the word import. Again, the way that we did that was came from admin, tools, import. Um, Joel asked a question a second ago that says, does hypothesis work with the password restricted option? Uh, the answer is yes, and we'll talk about hypothesis a bit later. But the answer to that is yes. Okay. So we've just imported some content from a Word document. Another thing that we could do is we might find a book in Pressbooks that exists as, that has these downloads available. So I'm going to grab the Pressbooks XML, which is the whole book that I can import via XML. So I could also come here and say, let's take part of this book and let's import it here by doing an XML import. And so I'll pick the file that I just downloaded. It's in my downloads folder. Okay. And I will say, begin import. And so Pressbooks says, oh, okay, we found this really big book. How much of this do you want to bring in? Well, all I'm really looking for are these OER con conversations and OER examples. So I've just picked just two chapters from an existing book, and I'm going to import those into Pressbooks now. So if you have an existing Pressbook, it's really easy to import if you have a file available. Um, and I'll show you in just a second a couple of other options to bring content in that are importing. And so that import finished up, and now OER conversations and OER examples, an exact editable copy has just been brought in for me. Here's another book that I really like. Um, this was by uh, Terry Green, who works supporting open pedagogy in Canada at Fleming College. It's called the Open Faculty Patchbook. It's this really beautiful community quilt of pedagogy. It's available under a CCBY license, and it's in Pressbooks. And I was reading this the other day and there was a chapter that's in development, but I really liked it. It's called Being Kind Online. So Jessica O'Reilly has written a few strategies to promote productive online student behaviors. I love this chapter. I'd like to bring it in. Um, I noticed on this book, it's got a CCBY license, but it didn't have the downloads available. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to grab this URL right here, or I'll even grab the URL of the whole book. And here I'm going to say, imp I'm going to come to tools and import, sorry, tools import. And this time I'm going to say a web page or a Pressbooks web book. And I'm going to import from the URL. So I'll just paste the URL. And now Pressbooks is going to use our API and talk to that book and say, okay, we've located the book. Which part of this book did you want to get? And I want the be kind online chapter. So I will say import that. And the auth I just had a question in the chat that says, when you import another Pressbook via XML, does it also update the contributor for attribution? The answer to that is yes, and also it depends. So let's take a look at this Be Kind Online chapter. So I'm going to look at this, and you'll notice the author, Jessica O'Reilly, came in as the attributed author, who was also attributed originally. The other thing that I went too fast to show you was when we import via this method, let me go ahead and put that URL back again. You also have the option to grab the book's metadata, generally, if it's, if it's available. Sometimes you could grab uh, the book information or part of the book and bring it in. Okay, so Val asked another question. Will importing a book with CC limits such as uh, no uh, NC automatically follow the section and force the whole book to be NC? That's another great question. So the answer to this is no. I'm going to get to licensing in a little bit more detail a little bit later if you're okay waiting. I 
I'll, it's probably easier for me to, to share that in a little later in the order. Okay, so what I've just shown you so far though is content in three different forms. A Word document, uh, what else did I show you? Uh, an XML file from Pressbooks and an open Pressbooks webbook and we can import it in chunks. The other thing we could do is we could actually start with the whole book. Here's another great Pressbooks project. This was written by Mike Caulfield. It's a book all about information literacy and web literacy for fact checking. Certainly now is a time to be thinking about this and be aware of this with the kind of uh, present discourse around a lot of different things. But here's a great book. It's published again under a CCBY license and it's got tons of great chapters. I might wanna start with this book, just the whole thing. And so I'm gonna say, let's take this whole book and rather than importing it into an existing book, I'm gonna to come to my books and say, clone a book. And I'm gonna give it the source URL and I'm gonna say, fact, I'm gonna say web literacy is the name of this book. Okay, great, the URL on my network. And I'm gonna click clone it. And now what Pressbooks is doing is the API for my network is talking to the other network and it says, is there a book at this address? And it says, yes. He says, okay, great. Is that book public? And it checks and says, yes. Does it have a Creative Commons license that, allow, that would allow me to make a copy without permission or granting me permission? And it says, yes. And now Pressbooks is saying, great. Okay, here we go. Now I'm getting the whole book. So it's gonna go get the metadata. It's gonna get the attribution information. It's gonna get the content in the books. It's gonna get the images. It's gonna get the embedded, uh, if it has a interactive content, it's gonna go grab the H5P activities and bring those over. Everything that it can grab and bring over, it will grab and bring over. And we're waiting, because it takes about a minute or so, especially as I'm screen sharing. Okay, I'm gonna look at the chat now maybe and take a couple of questions while we wait for this to wrap up. Um, uh, someone else asked, maybe you'll answer later, but wondering about importing a Word document with EndNote references. Will it preserve their hyperlinks to the end bibliography in the Word document? Um, probably not, though it depends. I, I'm not really sure what will happen with EndNote references. A lot of things that happen in Microsoft Word are kind of unique to Word, and it's very difficult to translate them to other software. What I will point out, though, is we have a very nice guide to using Pressbooks. I will drop this in the chat. Um, if I can find the chat. So let me send this to everyone. Here is the chat link to the guide. And in the guide, there's a great chapter. It's all about, it's called short codes. And short codes are these magical things that let you um, use a short code in your Word document and it will turn it into the right HTML element in Pressbooks. So when you saw that document that I showed you that I imported from Word, the, the way I was able to make headings was by in Word, just writing heading, close heading, and it turned it into a heading like this. You can do that with code, you can do it with emails, you can do it with LaTeX equations or math, you can do it with block quotes, footnotes, and other kinds of things. So if you format it like this in your Word document, then yes, it will work. If you format it in some other way, it's if it's a link, generally it will work, but if it's using a complicated system, like maybe you have an EndNote integration or a footnote. I can't speak to that exactly, but I will say this guide chapter may be helpful for answering that question. There's also a guide chapter about advice for preparing, formatting a Word document before you import it. And both of those are up to date and should be pretty helpful. Um, okay, so I come back to my clone. It told me success. I cloned this book. Val also reminded us, remember to note what you've changed in the clone book if you plan to publish and edit a book, make it easy to distinguish the version. That's great advice, Val. And I can show you in a little bit later some tools that help make that really easy. So here's this book. I've made an exact copy of this fact, this web literacy for student fact checkers. It's still authored by Mike Caulfield, still has the Creative Commons license. The big difference is it's on my network now rather than the original network. You'll also notice that we've automatically included a source statement, which tells people this book is a cloned version of the original with a link. It was published under a CCBY license. It may differ from the original. So we're trying to follow automatic good practices of giving attribution when we make a clone in that particular case. So that's importing content and cloning content. Great, okay. So I'm gonna jump in and we're gonna go back to my test book here on my network. So. It's, uh, where did I call it? 
I think I called it webinar demo book. Okay, so here's my webinar demo book. From the organize menu, I'm going to say I would like to create a new part or a new section in this book. And I'm going to add a part and I'm going to call this section two. Demo fun. I don't know. That's a terrible section name, but it's what I came up with. I'm not real creative on the fly. I'm a little nervous, right? Okay. So I've created a new section that, or a new part in this book. And I'm going to start by moving some chapters down into that part. And, and I'd actually like OER examples to be come first so I could click move up. I changed my mind. I want OER conversation. Ah, I think that's good. So you can move pieces of content between parts or between sections like that. The other thing that I can do is I can create a new chapter. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to create a new chapter by clicking add a chapter. This chapter is going to be a demonstration of the editor. And I'm going to click create. I've just made the chapter. You'll notice that a few things are available for me in this menu here. First, I'm in the regular text editor. And most people will probably want to work in the visual editor. So you just click that tab. And you, what you'll see now is a WYSIWYG or a visual editor. It'll look a lot like Microsoft Word or a word processor if you used one before. The first thing I might want to do is add a heading. So I'm going to say, um, what's this going to be about? Uh, music around the world. There are many musical traditions. Goodness. So I've, I've added a heading here, and then there's a paragraph, and I could add a new paragraph. I could also say, let's make this bold, and let's make this italicize. Let's start to add a bulleted list. List item one, Bulgaria, China, uh, Mozambique, etc. right? I can add a numbered list. I can add a block quote. I can then turn some of these things into uh, a link. So for example, let's make this a link by clicking on this link button and typing the URL I want to link to, pressbooks.org. So I've just made a link there that's in my book. The other thing that I may want to do is add a kind of special format. So there's a bunch of kind of pre-formatted options that are common for book publishing. For example, if this were a works cited page, I might want to apply the hanging indent so it's all formatted like a works cited page. I might want to make a pull quote if I'm trying to make it look more booky. Um, and then there's a number of text boxes. So these text boxes are pretty fun. So I'm going to come in and add a text box. And the first text box I want to add is a learning objectives text box. Boom. It's made a pre-made learning objective text box. So in this section, in this chapter, you will learn how to, let's, let's say, how to recognize the major musical traditions of the world. Uh, how to identify some of the primary differences in rhythm and instrumentation, I don't know, et cetera, et cetera. Now at the bottom, I might want to say, okay, now I've got learning objectives. Let's add another text box that's going to be key takeaways. And here in between, I'm going to add, okay, so let's, after this list here, I'm ready to add another heading, and this would be a second level heading. It's going to, be to say uh, music of Scandinavia. There are many countries in Scandinavia. All with unique musical traditions. Right, and then I'm going to say, let's make a text box and let's call this one examples. So there's an example text box. And I might say example Iceland. And then I would start, I'd be like Bjork, obviously, right? Because that's the first example I think it was Iceland. All right. Now I might say, okay, what else do I want to put in this chapter? So I've got some text boxes. Um, and then I'm going to say, well, one thing that might enhance this would be some visual examples. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Creative Commons image search, and I'm going to look for something. So I'm going to look for Icelandic music. 
Um, or, oh, here, this, is, this is nice. Maybe this is the image that I want to use. So I clicked on this image and I found uh, this particular image. So Joel's question is, uh, are these textbooks, these text box inputs, I believe should be available globally, universally on any Pressbooks account. Yeah. Um, is there an easy way to add the umlaut? Yes, there totally is. Um, if you know the keyboard symbol, Andrew, um, you could add it to the keyboard symbol. I can never remember how to type accents because I'm pretty monolingual. So the secret cool way to do this is there's a special character thing that lets you choose from all the available characters in the character set. So, okay, here it is. It's the O diuresis. I think that's the Bjork that she uses. Is that right? We'll find out. Okay, there's Bjork. Um, all right. <laughs> so that's a nice little trick if you want to add special characters. Um, there's a special character button that helps you find them from a visual representation rather than having to know the keyboard commands. All right, so let's say I'm back in my Creative Commons search and I found this beautiful image of someone, a statue of someone playing a stringed instrument in Iceland. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, where is this image from? Oh, it's from Flickr. So I'll go to Flickr. I found this image. It's released under a Creative Commons BC, BYNC license. So let's download this image. I'll do it in the medium size. I don't need it to be too big. Come back to my chapter and I'm going to start by inserting this media. So I'm going to take this, upload the image. I've just uploaded the image. The first thing I'm going to do is always give it alt text. So statue of violinist in Lake Gavik. I'm just trying. And the title of this image, uh, Alf Eagle. No, that's the author. Um, Iceland Reykjavik Harpa Music Hall. Okay, so I'll come in and add a title. And then I'm gonna give an attribution here because I, I got this image from somewhere. So I'll say, here's where I found the image. There's my URL. The author was Alf Eagle. Great name, by the way. And I could give their URL if I wanted to. In this case, the license was CCBYNC. Great. And I didn't adapt it at all, so I'm just gonna drop it into the chapter. So I just inserted an image into the Pressbooks chapter. The next thing I may want to do is to say, I like multimedia here. And what I want to do is I want to add a video. So in this particular case, I went to Vimeo and I found this beautiful, this image of uh, an Icelandic pianist playing the song with the school teacher reading a poem. I like this video. I want it in my book. So I copy the URL. I put it on a new line in Pressbooks. I press paste and we will automatically embed the video for you. That's what it looks like from Vimeo. If I went to YouTube, I found a really nice video about compassion and the true meaning of empathy. It was a TED talk. So I'm gonna come down a bit further and one of the key takeaways is be compassionate. I just embedded that video here. So I've done a lot of editing. Let's take a look and save my chapter and see how it's looking so far. To view the chapter, I can either preview it or I could view the chapter here. Let's just view it and we'll see, okay, here's my title, here's the heading, my learning objectives, my bold and italics, my link, my image. Okay, there's the image. Nice. Okay. Um, there's the example. Here's the embedded video. Here's the key takeaway and here's the last embedded video. A few other things that you may want to do uh, would be to add a footnote. So I'm going to say let's create a footnote here by clicking this footnote button and say I'm a footnote. And what it's done is it's added a little short code and inside the short code is the content of my footnote. So let's turn this into a link. I can have a link inside of a footnote if I want. And there's my first footnote. Um, and if I come down a bit further, I'm gonna add a glossary term. So let's add a definition for Scandinavia. So what's the definition of Scandinavia? I'm gonna let Wikipedia teach me. Here we go, first sentence. A subregion. I'll just do two sentences here. So I copied that uh, and I'm gonna say the description of Scandinavia, a subregion in Northern Europe. And I'll just say, usually covers, okay, great. So I've created a definition there in Pressbooks with the glossary. Now, when I save this chapter, um, we will see here when we view the chapter, uh, this has a glossary term. So if I were to click on this, you would see my definition pop up and appear, and it could be automatically added to a glossary at the end of the book. 
and you'll then notice I have a footnote here. If I hover over it, you'll see the tooltip, and when I click it, it will jump me down to the footnote, and I will see the content of the footnote, and I can jump back up at any point to the content of the thing. I'm going to pause and take a couple questions from the chat. Um, Joel asked, is it okay to embed YouTube videos in a CCBY textbook? Yes, it is, Joel. Uh, when we're embedding a video, we are not making a copy. So uh, embedding something is just placing it in iframe. So uh, you have no copyright restrictions or concerns there. Um, if you were to download the video, you wouldn't be allowed to host or make copies. That would be a violation of copyright, but embedding doesn't violate copyright, my understanding. And then Anita asked, what are some universal accessibility features? Great. So adding alt text, I think I showed that in the demo for the image earlier, but in case you missed it, I'll go back and show you again. So if I were to add new media, um, let's come back to my demonstration of the editor chapter, and let's make sure that this image has alt text. So I'm going to click edit, and I will see, okay, here's where the alt text gets added. I added a statue of the violinist in Reykjavik. If we were to do this from scratch, let's go back and grab another image. Uh, okay, this Reykjavik Music Hall, I like it. I'm going to download this from Flickr. It also has a CCBY license. Oh, the same, same artist, doing a great job, Alf. Thanks for contributing to the commons. And so I'm going to say, let's add this media, upload the image. And this one was called Reykjavik Harpa Music Hall. So here I will say, enter the alt text and insert it into the chapter. So now this image has alt text. I could have also added a caption. So let's add the caption as well. And now the caption will display. So those are some of the things that you can do there. Um, there's lots of different content that you can share and embed here. Um, the question was, can you upload PowerPoint slides? Um, generally, there's a bunch of different kinds of media types that you can upload. This media tool is generally more useful when you're sharing images and, and audio files. Uh, I don't know if PowerPoint files are permitted as a file type. I believe they are, so you could try. I don't have PowerPoint on my computer, but if you were to upload a PowerPoint file, then you could link to it. Or if you had the, most commonly, I think people will host their material in something like a cloud storage tool. Like if you're at the University of Wisconsin, you could use Box. I know that's their cloud storage. And you would just drop the link into the file. And that would be a really easy way to link to a file that you've hosted elsewhere. But I think PowerPoint would be a permitted file type. Note that there's a 25 megabyte file upload limit per file for Pressbooks. We're not intending for Pressbooks to be a file storage system. But there are some cases where uploading that media can be very helpful for your book. Um, or you could create the slides as JPEGs or uh, lots of different questions in the chat here. I think people are discussing things. I don't think there's anything I need to directly respond to. Hopefully I've answered other people's questions so far. I'm going to take a drink of water. Okay. So what I've just shown you there is the basics of the editor, how we would add footnotes, how we'd add glossary, how we'd add media, how we would add links and other kinds of different things like that. So those are some of the basic tools for Pressbooks. I will also show you how you can add mathematics. So not all of you use math or math notation, but it's really common to want to be able to express math notation. So the simplest and easiest way is to simply use the short code LaTeX if you're writing an expression in LaTeX. So I'm going to say, okay, x to the second power plus I'm not a mathematician, so we'll say y to the third power equals z minus a. There is a math expression for you, algebraic expression. And I'll close the tag by saying LaTeX. What's going to happen now is when I save this and display it, in this particular chapter, you'll come down and you'll see, oh, this was turned into a math expression. And it's being rendered in my browser with an accessible math rendering tool called MathJax. What that means is that when I right click this image, I have all these different choices in the browser for how to display this, including a whole bunch of different accessibility tools. I can choose what language to display it in. I can choose that if I click this image, it will zoom and I can choose the zoom factor and the user can control all of these things. They can also control how the math is displayed. So I want to show the math as MathML. I want to show, there's a lots of different choices and accessibility options here that are really nice for MathJax. So, so uh, this is the math representation in the web book. So far, I've really focused on how do you make this book, uh, 
have stuff in it. And that's most of what you'll need to be able to do with Pressbooks. The next thing I guess I wanna show you here is, now that we've put a bunch of content in it, what other things can we do? So if I come back to organizing my book, I can say, all right, all of these chapters are ready to go. They're public in the web, my book is public, and they're also going to be visible in the exports. So let's talk about what an export is. An export is when you take your book in Pressbooks and you turn it into a file that could be downloaded and accessed offline. So Pressbooks is obviously great for making available content on the open public web, but you may also have users who aren't, don't have reliable internet access or who don't want to be connected to the web while they're accessing your learning material. So here's what can happen with the export. There are all of these different, um, yeah, Anita, I will talk about H5P and hypothesis. I'll leave some of the complicated stuff a little bit later, but let me show exports first. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing that we can do then is decide what kind of formats do I want to make this available in? Well, one, I want to make a print PDF. I'll also want to make an EPUB, which is an ebook format that people can read on their devices. If I want to do a Mobi, which is Kindle's proprietary format, I could do that. If I wanted to have a digital PDF, I could. And then there's a bunch of kind of less commonly used but still powerful formats. The common cartridge format is one you would use to connect your book to your learning management system. I'm not gonna show that in the demo today, but I think um, your local campus uh, support staff should be able to help you with that and I can answer questions about that maybe a different time. There's a video we'll share with it as a link as well. Um, you could select all, absolutely Val, if those are the formats you wanted. So um, it's gonna take me a little bit longer if I do all of them. So for this demo, I'll just do two of them um, and I will say export these books. So what it's doing is Pressbooks is running through the routine and it's turning my existing book into a PDF file and it's turning it into an EPUB file. And what will happen when it's done is the files I've just displayed will display here for me. So here's the EPUB, here's the print PDF. I haven't done any formatting, I haven't learned InDesign, but let's download this print PDF and see how it looks. So here is my print PDF for my Debinar book. It's a 50 page PDF that looks like a book. Joel, man, you're a published author, looking all right. We've got a, your copyright attribution, great job choosing a Creative Commons license, Joel. Here's your table of contents, main body, section two, and here's the actual book content. And it looks good, it looks ready to print, in my opinion. We've got a footnote here, we've got these columns, all the other stuff that we put in our book. Let's go look at our wacky chapter that I put all the weird stuff in. You'll notice in this particular chapter, okay, where am I at? It takes me a while to get there. Apologies if I'm making you dizzy. Okay, here we go. Here's the chapter, my learning objectives, my footnotes, my image, my math. It's being turned into an image for the PDF export. Here's another image. Um, here's a video and it told me, we can't obviously put a video in a print PDF, but here's a still shot from the image and here's where you could find that video on the web if you wanted to. So someone clicks on that link or types the link in and it takes them to the chapter. And again, the video was there. So that's kind of what will happen when you make your exports. Uh, and um, these export files could be downloaded and could be shared however you want. If you're using an EDU network or an open source network, there's also an option where you can make these files available for download on the homepage. I think you saw that when I was looking at this particular book, right? This person did choose four of these formats and made them available for download. To do that on that particular book, what you would go to is settings, sharing and privacy, and you would say, yes, share my latest export files. Once I've done that, now when I visit the home page for the book, you will see the EPUB and the print PDF are available for download for any visitor to the web. I've just made an open, openly licensed web book. And Val, I think you're right. I did, I did make it look so easy. It will take you a little bit longer probably to learn how to do the steps that I did, but there's a guide that covers it. And it really is like when we're doing web first editing or web first publishing, we do want to make it genuinely easy for you to make the knowledge that you've come up with or that you and your learners have come up with broadly available and accessible to all. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about the exports. I would also like to show you, maybe you don't like how that export looked. So in appearance, you have a bunch of different choices. If you're using a Pressbooks hosted network, you will see that there are 20 something premium themes. 
the theme will change the appearance of your book without you having to know any code. So right now I'm using McLuhan, which is a nice looking theme, but I really want to use, I don't want Bukowski, definitely not, but, uh, but, but I might like a Malala. Malala is a really nice textbook theme. So I'm going to activate the Malala theme. So now my book, if you'll notice when I visit my web book and visit my chapter, you'll see some subtle differences. Oh, the main primary text is now blue and you can see different typefaces are in use. That was just by changing the theme. I also have a bunch of theme options. Let's say I don't really like the green color of the learning objectives. I'd actually like to make it, oh, I don't know, red. My learning objectives are bloody, I don't know. Uh, and I'll make this like a light red or like a pink here and I'll say save changes now throughout the book oops wrong demo throughout the book when I refresh this you'll notice this green color is going to turn to red in just a second hey there we go I just changed that globally in my book without having to know coding these were some of the theme options that were available you'll see there's a ton of different theme options if you need to support other scripts or typefaces that Art, like if you're writing a book that has examples from Greek or Hebrew or Chinese or Gujarati or Korean or any other language that doesn't use the uh, Western, the West, the Latin alphabet, then you can declare support for those scripts. You can also choose to display attributions at the end of your chapter, a two label table, table of contents. You can change the labels from part to section or from chapter to unit or whatever you need the labels to be. You'll also notice that there are a bunch of web options that will apply to the web book only. So if I'm in Malala, you can actually change the typefaces, which is a really cool feature. We call it Shapeshifter. And you can also change the standard width of the book in the web. You can choose what happens with paragraphs, collapsing sections, image light boxes. When it comes to PDFs, this is pretty powerful. A lot of times people would used to use InDesign or these desktop publishing software. You have to it was a pretty steep learning curve. I used to use InDesign and it took me a long time to learn it. This lets you customize a lot of the print settings without having to really learn that much. So for example, I want this book actually to be uh, eight and a half by 11 to print it like a large textbook. So boom, I've just changed it. And I want the font size to be a little smaller. I want it to be 11 and I want the line height to be 1.2 instead. And I like the margins as they are, but if I wanted them, I could make it a little bit bigger. Let's make the outside inside margins a little larger. I'm just changing the margins globally and I want a hyphenation on in my book and I'd like to do indentation. That's great. I want no blank pages. So the page sections won't be on blank pages anymore. I do want the table of contents. I want them to be end notes rather than footnotes and I'm going to leave the rest. So I've just changed a few PDF settings here. Now when I go back and export, we're going to just make the PDF export. And this PDF will look a lot different than the last PDF. Um, just simply by changing some of those, the theme and the theme settings. Okay, so I'm going to download that, and now let's look. I haven't done any coding, I haven't done anything super magical, but you'll now notice we're using a different theme. This book looks pretty different. First of all, it's 35 pages instead of 50. The book's a bit, the pages are bigger. And here's the new title page, it's formatted differently. And the table of contents looks a bit different. And when I come down to my section, you can see my type, my font's probably too small there, but uh, so I can go back and change it and make it a little bit bigger. But when I get back to my section, the headings all look different. The text boxes look a bit different. And in my section, I've now got a red learning objectives box. So there's, for example, and Val has some great recommendations for typefaces there. A lot of times people do recommend serif typefaces for reading in print and sans serif typefaces for reading on the web. And there's a, kind of a contradictory body of research and information about that, but those guidelines have generally held true for a long time. Um, okay, uh, how to format a Word document that you import. The last thing I guess I'll show, I won't demo this in great detail, but if there's something you don't like about the appearance of your book, you can change pieces and parts of it using something called CSS. This is a little bit advanced, most users won't touch it, so I won't talk about it in too great of a detail. But here you'll see, here are all the different CSS options available from my web book. Here are all the rules that we're already applying. So let's say I want to change, I don't know, let's pick some element in my book. Uh, the publisher city element. <laughs> okay, so here are all the rules for the publisher city. 
I want the publisher city actually to be, all I'm going to change is make it really big. So it's going to look annoyingly big. So I've just changed the font size to four times how big it was before. I'm going to save that. The next time I, I display the publisher city, it's going to look a lot bigger. I have a separate style sheet for the ebook, a separate style sheet for the PDF and you can control all of them separately. It allows you to kind of customize the appearance of your book if you're the kind of person that likes to have, uh, if you're a perfectionist, I guess, which some of us are. <laughs> um, and you may have a local uh, web person or a local uh, web developer who has a bit more experience with CSS who may be willing to help you and, and uh, get started with some of the CSS customizations. Because this is a little bit codey, so most end users probably won't touch it. Val had a question, which is, if I import metadata from my book I like, does it include the CSS? No. Generally, when you bring in the content, it'll bring in the content, and Pressbooks will use its book, will use the CSS for your book theme as the way of styling and, and displaying it. Sometimes, however, you'll accidentally copy-paste stuff that will come with its own inline styles. Sometimes you like that, and sometimes you don't. If you notice that you've copy-pasted something and it looks weird, one easy thing that you can do is highlight it and click this clear formatting button. That will strip in a way any formatting or cruft that came in when you copy paste it. There's also this tool that will let you just paste it as text and that will also help you avoid bringing in formatting that you don't want. Because that's a really annoying thing. Rather than having to go into the text editor and have to learn HTML, it's pretty easy to just clear or strip the formatting with these two buttons here. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second and look back at my chat. Um, okay, Joel asked, what kind of recommendations do you have for what kind of headings? Okay, basically the, the main recommendation for accessibility for headings is always start with H1, go down to H2. Don't skip headings just because you like the look. They should be used in sequential order and H1s should be siblings of each other, H2s should be used for children, and H2s should be siblings of each other, and so forth down in a book. Now, if you're using multiple headings, so in this particular book, let me show you a couple things that are possible. We went down in this demonstration of the editor, and we added a couple of H1s. So here's an H1. I'm going to add another one that's called, uh, let me just turn this into an H1, just for demonstration purposes. Okay, so I have two H1s in this book, and I will add a third H1 that's like wrapping up. So I've added three top level headings to this particular chapter. Now, in my book appearance, in my theme options, you'll notice that what I can do if I want is I can enable a two level table of contents. What this will do is display the top level headings under the chapter titles in my table of contents. So what's nice about this is, Joel, if you wanted to be able to display your headings inside of a chapter, now my book, when I visit it, you'll notice, here's my table of contents. This is a, a section, it expands into a chapter, and chapters that have headings will show those headings in the table of contents. So here are the three headings I just created. I'm gonna jump directly to music of Scandinavia. Boom, it's anchored, it jumped to that. And in my table of contents in the book, you'll also see those top level headings will appear as section headings there. So that's how I would advise if you really want to be able to have subsections inside of chapters, think about how you want to structure your book. A chapter can be anything, right? So you could have a chapter be very, very big, or you could have a chapter be a smaller chunk, and it can also contain chunks inside of it with top level headings. Another thing that's possible is to have the, each of the sections collapsed by default. Not everyone uses this feature. I don't, it's not my favorite feature. I don't generally use it, but some people like to do this. So in the web options, what you would do is you'd say collapse my sections. And what this means is when I go view um, the, the chapter of the book with collapsed sections, you'll see, you'll notice these sections are collapsed and then it can be expanded. We'll collapse and expanded. So it's just a way of maybe, maybe the chapter doesn't look so scary when you first load it, or you only jump into the pieces that you want. Again, that's user preference. Those can be turned on and off in the theme settings. Okay, that was Joel's question. I hope that got to the question that you uh, were asking there. Um, Val, I, asked, I think I answered the question about word imports earlier. And then 
Um, Ahmed, would you please send us the link to this webinar? Yes, sir. Uh, definitely we'll do that. I don't know how you heard about it exactly, but what I, what I will do is after this webinar is over, um, we'll record it and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel. So I'll paste, I'll give the link to everybody here um, in the chat. This is our Prespix YouTube channel. We post old webinars here in the, right on the YouTube channel. This webinar should be available hopefully by the end of this week. We're gonna send it away and get captions put on it so it's, multi, it's as accessible as possible. That takes us a couple of days usually, but it will be available soon. Yes, so how to, how to license accounts. So, so Pressbooks can be used uh, in three different ways, generally. Pressbooks is open source software. And the first way to use it is as an open source user. So if you're an open source user, that means that you go and you get the Pressbooks software and you download it and install it on a server. That's how I started with Pressbooks. Way back in the day when we were first doing it at the University of Wisconsin, I installed it on a local university server and I was running Pressbooks for lots of people. And that quickly became, for me, scary and unsustainable because I wasn't a skilled DevOps person and a network user. But um, if your university has the time and interest and resources, you can download the software and install it. Let me show, there is, there's some documentation here for how to install and use Pressbooks. And so there's where you can download the open source components. And if you are a DevOps or a kind of technically minded person, you should be able to follow these instructions and install Pressbooks. Pressbooks lives, the repositories live in a place called GitHub. And I will show you the Pressbooks GitHub page is GitHub at Pressbooks. And the main repository is Pressbooks here. So I will paste a link to the GitHub here and I will paste it to here. The main advantage of having Pressbooks as an open source user is you have total control of what you do with the software and you run it and it's, it does whatever you want it to do or it doesn't do whatever you don't want it to do. The main downsides to doing it that way is uh, you are responsible for it. So the part that was hard for me was I had to update. We, we release you know, updates to Pressbooks regularly. We're adding new features and other kinds of things. So you have to know what you're doing. You have to make sure that you keep it secure. Unless you do this professionally or that you have real experience in it, it's probably not for the faint of art. It's definitely not for an ordinary instructor to just I, I think that would be unwise to just run your own Pressbooks network, though you could if, that, if you're curious and a tinkerer. The second way to use Pressbooks as an individual user, I'll show you, um, would be to simply get started as a single person at Pressbooks.com. So there is Pressbooks for it, faculty, authors, or self-publishers. What it tells you is that you can create an account here for free, and you can begin by creating a bookshell or a sandbox book here at Pressbooks.com. So I would log in. I already have an account at Pressbooks.com. You'd create an account. If I can remember my account, this is what it would look like. It's basically a huge Pressbooks network that we host and run for, fa for individuals or for faculty authors. Most of the people who use Pressbooks.com are self-published authors or kind of faculty working on their own. And that would be, let me show an example of what it looks like when you log in here. You will see a very similar dashboard to what I was just showing you. And you will find that you can make a book and it will be private. And in order to publish it to the web or to produce exports, there will be a small one-time fee. It used to be free for, we used to make it free for people to publish their open books to the web. But we found that we were having a re too many spam books whenever you let people publish stuff to the web for free. Uh, bad stuff happens. So there's a, I believe it's about $20 to make, your, make a book public. It's a one-time fee. And then to produce uh, exports. And I think it's about $100 if you want to do both PDF and EPUB exports. But your Pressbooks.com would look like this. The third way that many people use Pressbooks is that Pressbooks as a company, the main way that we make money as a business is by hosting an individual Pressbooks network for an, a university or an organization or a consortium. So that's what the University of Wisconsin, who we're doing this webinar for, does. And that's what maybe 100 or so other universities around the world do. They say, we want Pressbooks, and they will pay Pressbooks, and we will host Pressbooks for them, we'll provide training and support. And so when that happens, your university will have, it's like a campus service, like your LMS, or like any other campus supported tool. So we would be the vendor in that case, hosting this open source software for folks. If you're not sure whether your campus has Pressbooks, I can probably look that up for you. And if you want to get in touch with us about using Pressbooks for institutions, I'm not a salesperson, but um, 
I believe that there is good information on our website about press books for educational institutions. So it describes it here, what that looks like and the different plans. And then there's a contact form for how to find out more about press books for institutions. Whew. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so an institution or a campus or a community could use press books either as a, institutions generally either self-host or they will host with us. Um, our hosting rates for institutions are pretty low. They're lower than a lot of other ed tech vendors. Um, and you're not paying for a license. You're paying for the SaaS hosting services and the human services like training and support. So that helps us keep the prices low. That's one of the great benefits of open source software, I think. Uh, there were a couple questions earlier. I'm sorry to go into the business side of things, but a couple questions earlier about both H5P and about hypothesis. I know we've reached about an hour. I scheduled this for an hour and a half. If any of you feel like you need to leave or you have other things to do, please feel free. But what I'm going to show you now would be how you can do things with interactivity or quizzing and interactive elements and how you can do things with annotation, um, which are both pretty fun and exciting pieces of press books um, and make use of some other open source tools. All right, so let me start with annotation. Um, and I will start by showing you an example from a book that I used to teach with when I was at the University of Wisconsin. So my PhD and the, the way I met Joel actually, uh, who's in this was was I got a, a PhD in English literature and one of my favorite poets is a Wisconsin poet. Her name's Lorraine Niedeker. And here is a poem by Lorraine Niedeker where I provided a little bit of contextual history with some footnotes, a very short eight line poem. And then you can see here's a quiz that I built with H5P. I'll get to the quiz part later, but if you can, I don't know if you can see or not, but you should be able to see there's this yellow highlighting on the web version of this book. If you'd like to look at it yourself, you can. Uh, I'll put the link in here. And this highlighting is provided by an open source tool called Hypothesis. If I click on one of these highlights, an annotation pane will expand. I'm logged in. It's a free account with Hypothesis, which will allow me to make new annotations. But you don't have to be logged in to read annotations. So in, the, in this particular example, this is the public annotation layer for this book. And you can see in this, this book, I've chosen the text New Goose. And in the annotation, I put a, cover, a picture of the cover of the book and the title page. So this is cool. Right? I mean, I'm annotating this book and showing people what this book looked like when it was published in the 40s. Someone annotated the word Edinburgh, Scotland with a map of Edinburgh. Nice. <laughs> way, way back in 2017. Someone else, me, said, I want this to be a class discussion question. So this poem starts by mentioning a person named Blackhawk. So my question for my class is, who was Blackhawk? And you'll notice there's this little reply button. So anybody in the world could log in and could reply to this. So someone said he was a Native American leader in Wisconsin in the 19th century. Near the end of his life, he was captured by the US government and displayed on tour. So those are some answers. And there are lots of other answers for who was Blackhawk, right? So that could be, uh, I could be leading a class discussion or conversation on or adjacent to the text. I could be doing this in public, which is what you're seeing now. I'll show you a few other things that can happen in the annotation layer. You can put links. You could put, let's see, uh, here's an image. And in the replies, you can see here's a YouTube video. For actually serving up the pawpaw fresh. So she mentions, Larry Niedeker mentions pawpaw, which is a tree that, that blossoms in the Midwest. It also has an edible fruit. And so here's a video about eating the pawpaw fruit. And then here's a link that has a bunch of pawpaw recipes. And then down here, here's an audio element of Lorraine Niedeker reading a poem. Or closure. Now, I could have put all of that stuff here in the main body of the text, but I really want students to first focus on reading this and the poem, and then later I want them to go through and do the annotation type activity. So that's why we made some of those design decisions. The other thing that you'll notice is that I'm viewing the public layer. I could make a private group for my English class and only invite students to join it. And then I'd switch to that layer. This is the same book. And there are another set of different annotations on this layer that are only visible in this private group. So for example, someone wrote, remember this. This is some piece of the thing they wanted to remember. Someone else in the class, here's a question from the instructor. Deidre was Stuart's husband and still loves, lives in London. Why do you think people tend to focus on the male members of publishing couples? So this is a question for the class to think about. 
And then the answer was, I think it's because sexism or whatever reason like this student's made. Like you could have a conversation layer here with, with annotation. The annotation pane can be expanded or made smaller. It can be displayed or turned off. You can turn it on or off as the reader. This is just built into the book. You don't have to install extra software. You don't have to do anything. You can choose, do I want this tool to be part of my book or not? Now that's hypothesis. So to show you how to turn that on, in the particular book I'm working in. So let's come back to my test example. Uh, it was called Webinar Demo Book. In Webinar Demo Book, I'm going to come to Settings, Hypothesis. And I'm going to say, do I want to allow hypothesis on my book? If so, where do I want to allow it? I want to allow it, in this case, only on chapters. Or I could say only on chapter, and I could give a list of numbers or which chapters I want it to be in. But for now, I'm going to say all chapters can have it. So now when I visit this book and load a chapter, this webinar book that we just made together today, you'll notice here's hypothesis. So I could start by annotating musical traditions in the world. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to, I made this uh, Spotify playlist last month of uh, multilingual music from around the world. So I'm going to drop a Spotify playlist in the annotation layer here. And I'm going to put it in the public layer so that everybody can see it. So uh, maybe I didn't. I failed to do it. Pretend I did. And I'll say link. <laughs> and I posted that link as an annotation there in the annotation tool. So that's an, a way that you can turn hypothesis on and make it visible and useful in your book. So you'll see, okay, here's annotation. Um, yeah, do you want the link to the book so you can play with annotation? Sure. Happily, Val. Val, I just dropped the link in the chat. So if you want to go ahead and turn on, the thing that you will need to do if you've never used Hypothesis before, again, is if you haven't been in before, you'll see a button that says sign up or log in. You would need to sign up and it would take you to a sign up thing. Hypothesis is a free and open source tool. I think they're a great company. We really like them. We love working together with them in open education. Um, you can decide for yourself whether you trust them and want to create an account. Even if you don't create an account, you still should be able to read public annotations. Okay, the second thing that I want to show you is something called H5P. And the way that I want to demo this is actually, I'll take you to a book that's on the Wisconsin network that um, a former graduate student of mine who now works at the University of Wisconsin doing faculty pedagogy, pedagogical development has made. This is a terrific resource. Naomi Salmon, it, this is an interactive resource guide for o open education. And down in this chapter, you'll see all different kinds of activities. Like, for example, a bunch of language instruction activities are here. There's a spe specific kind of resource that a lot of people at Wisconsin were making that were called case scenarios and critical readers. And Mallory and Andrew would be only too familiar with those. So there's a bunch of examples of those. And then a bunch of different other kinds of things, exhibit books, um, web only act H5P activities, lots of cool examples of things that you could make to make a book more interactive done in Pressbooks with different tools. So let me jump and show you, let's do a image hotspot. This one's pretty fun. Oh yes, Joel, here's the OER source book. I'll drop the link in the, in the chat. Okay, so what Naomi will do here is say, okay, in this particular activity, you're gonna see the example of an H5P activity called image hotspot. So here's an example where we're learning Dutch for canine anatomy. So here's a picture of a dog. All of these pieces are labeled and I click on this and this is going to say, stop, overgang to a schnädel on schmied. I don't know what that means, but probably the nose of a dog. I don't know. <laughs> Here's the back of a dog. And this is how we would say this, right? And so we've added some annotation. This was an H5P activity. I could grab this H5P activity and reuse it somewhere, or I could clone the book and get it that way. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick a different activity that's actually one that... Uh, uh, let's go to the f f flashcards. Okay, this is fun. Here's a set of Span Spanish flashcards. Arándanos azules. So blueberries, and someone's pronounced it for me in Spanish. Arándanos azules. Blueberries. Okay, cool. The second one in the set. Frambuesas. Those are raspberries. Fresas. Okay, I like this activity. I want to use it. I'm downloading the source file. Now I'm coming back to my book. I'm coming into the admin. Um, Normally I would come to plugins and I would activate H5P. I already did that before. And then once it's activated, you'll see 
I have the ability to make H5P content down here. I will click add new. I will say, yes, I want to use the tool. And then you will see there are about 40 different interactive content types that you can make with H5P. They range from very simple, like true false questions to really complex, like branching scenarios where you choose this and it shows you one page, you choose something else. And you can make really powerful interactives of all different types. In this case, rather than making a new one, I'm going to upload an existing one. So I'm going to upload the file. I just downloaded this flashcard activity from Naomi. And this activity is now in my book. So let's say I want to, instead of Spanish berry names, I'm going to turn it into French berry names. And uh, I th is, it, is that the word for blueberries? I think it is. And then I'd say framboises. Uh, I think it's framboise. It's been a while. And I'll just do the first two. I'm getting kind of ahead of myself. So I've just made a new H5P activity. So here you'll see this is the activity I've just made based on the one Naomi shared with me. Blueberries. Okay. And then I could continue editing it or I could share it. If I come into my book now and go to my editor demonstration chapter, adding the H5P to the chapter will be just the same as adding uh, an image where I might say, instead of add media, there's a button that says add H5P. And I'll say language dialogue, insert that. You'll see a short code has been inserted. And when I preview this chapter, you'll now notice, okay, my activity that I've just made is now embedded and available to anyone who visits this book. So it's available on the web for free. Um, someone has just chatted. It was a private chat, but I will share it because I agree. Pressbooks plus H5 plus hypothesis beats tool name redacted hands down a million times better and all OER. So again, the point here is that each one of these tools is open source and the content that we've made, all of this can be openly licensed, which means that you can reuse it and adapt it and other people can take this, clone it, and make it better very, very quickly. For me, at least, that's the kind of vision of the future education world of sharing and accessible learning that I want to see, I want to build, I want to be a part of. And hopefully you've catch a little bit of that excitement and are starting to think of some of the exciting uh, things that you can do. The other thing that I want to stress is, so these are um, stressful times for people, especially if you're moving a course from face-to-face -to, -face to online very quickly. It's best to keep it simple. Plain text is a really great way to communicate things. It's been a great way for a long time. It's accessible. Uh, it's generally available. It doesn't require a lot of internet bandwidth to consume, unlike this video. Um, and it's something that can often be read and used offline. Pressbooks is, of course, really good at delivering plain text. So probably you want to start simple. And then over time, you may want to gradually iterate and add increasing levels of complexity or of interactivity. But the possibility for like building really engaging learning materials is really high. And we would love to see the stuff that you make. And we'd also really encourage you to openly license it and share it with others if you feel like that's appropriate for your situation. Anita's question was, can you track downloads of ebook and PDF files? Yes, you can. What I will show you is if you are a network manager, so if you run your own network or if you are someone that administers a Pressbooks network, there is an integration here for example, with Google Analytics. So I would look here and I would say, this network can send information to a Google Analytics dashboard that you control. And then every time someone downloads a file, it will share with you in your Google Analytics dashboard which book it was and which file format was downloaded so that you could report number of downloads pretty easily. Um, there is a network manager guide that covers some of these things that we make available. I'll share that with you in the chat. Uh, and there's a chapter here about configuring Google Analytics for Pressbooks. So, so Anita, that's hopefully the answer to your question about um, how you might want to know more information about book downloads or PDF files. Um, there are additional tools for network managers to understand what's happening on their network, but that's not generally directly relevant to end users, so I'd leave that out. But your network managers can tell you more about that, or you can kind of read through the network manager dashboards to see more about some of the statistics that are available for network managers. Uh, 
Another thing that I will mention is if you do have a campus that's either self-hosting Pressbooks or that's hosting with us, generally there will be people on your campus that will be your local Pressbooks administrators or we sometimes call them network managers. That's usually the best person to go to with your first level of questions about Pressbooks. If you're at the University of Wisconsin, um, those people are going to be Andrew Turner and Mallory Conlon, who you probably already know because they invited you to this call. Um, and those are the people that you'll go to with your questions about Pressbooks. They maintain really good documentation. They have, I think, some KB docs about Pressbooks locally. And if you have a question, you go to them. And if they can't answer it or they have questions, they will come to us at Pressbooks and we'll provide support for them as one of our clients. There's also, if you're an open source user, we have an open community here for open source users. It's called pressbooks.community. It's a discourse forum. And that is the the link there for uh, Pressbooks community. And you can see open source users discussing things and helping each other out there. 